Good afternoon. My name is Russ Lewell, and I'm very happy to introduce the latest European webinar from Ecolab, this time on the topic of food safety and the essential components of a strong food safety program. You may not be aware that almost half of all foodborne illnesses originate in commercial food service facilities, and proper cleaning and food preparation procedures can help reduce the risks. As always with our webinars, we do like to hear directly from you, and you can take part right now in our live poll question, which you'll see on this slide and on the right side of your screen. We'd like you to answer this question, which of these is a main barrier to hand washing in your business? Why don't staff wash their hands correctly? Are they too busy? Is it not a priority? Is the hand sink out of sight? Are soap and paper towels not readily available? Do staff complain their skin gets irritated if they wash their hands too frequently? Maybe staff don't see the link between hand hygiene and foodborne illness. Or could it be that staff wear gloves and don't believe they need to wash their hands? You can select more than one answer and we'll summarize your feedback in just a few moments. As we always ask for suggestions for webinar topics that would be interesting and important for you, one popular request was the importance of a strong food safety program. So we're delighted to bring you that topic today. And don't forget, if you do have ideas for subjects you'd like us to cover in future webinars, please let us know. We'd also love to get your feedback to today's webinar. At the end of today's session, there will be a pop-up window with a short survey, and we'd certainly appreciate if you could take just a few minutes to give us your feedback. Also, you'll receive a recording of today's webinar via email this week, so look out for that in your inbox. So the poll question you've been answering was on the topic of hand hygiene, but there's so much more to a strong food safety program than hand washing. So let's take a look at today's uh, agenda. Today's agenda is the importance of food safety. We'll talk through the components of a strong food safety program. Uh, we'll certainly answer your questions and answers, and I would like to remind you that we'll be happy to do so. Uh, you can register your questions using the Q&A button that you can see on your screen. Uh, some attendees already posed questions during the registration process, and our aim is to answer as many questions as possible over the next 60 minutes. But if there are questions we don't get to answer today, we will follow up with you via your local Ecolab representative. And then finally, we'll wrap up with some closing comments. So now it's time to meet our expert speaker for today's event. Dr. Ruth Petran is Ecolab's Vice President of Food Safety and Public Health and she provides technical expertise and consultation to internal and external customers on food safety and public health issues. As well as being a member of the International Association for Food Protection and a professional member of the Institute of Food Technologists, Ruth is also recognized as a certified food scientist. So as you can see, Dr. Ruth Petran is well placed to give you exactly the information you need for your food safety program. So we'll say good afternoon, Ruth. So actually, before you get underway, uh, Ruth, let's take a look at the results of the poll that we ran just a few uh, moments ago. So, uh, Christine, can you reveal uh, the answers to the poll questions? Um, so, uh, Ruth looks like um, too busy is uh, the main uh, cause uh, there, and then uh, staff wearing gloves and, and not necessarily seeing the link uh, between uh, hand hygiene and foodborne uh, illness. So, R Ruth, is that pretty uh, typical of the uh, results that we always get with such a question in your experience? Actually, it is, and I'm sorry that I was on mute before and, and did not acknowledge your <laughs> greeting to me. No problem. And Good I afternoon again. <laughs> Thank you. But, yes, I agree that, that um, the selections that were noted here in the poll are what we see, and um, especially on the not seeing the link between hand hygiene and foodborne illness is something that I have seen repeatedly. So um, I think this leads us in well to the topic at hand. Next slide, please. So I want to address the importance of food safety to start off, go through some facts and figures to help make this link perhaps a little more strongly between things like hand hygiene and other behaviors and the incidence of foodborne illness. Next slide, please. These data are summarized each year by the European Food Safety Authority. They do lag a year or so behind, unfortunately, but it's what we have. And they do 
will reveal some interesting things. Um, first of all, the fact that we have seen a dramatic decline in reported outbreaks of salmonella, which is the top line on the graph, is certainly good news. Um, however, the other organisms and, and uh, agents of illness that we see here, those related to viruses and toxins, um, generally have been flat over time, indicating that there's opportunities here to focus in on these agents that do cause a fair number of foodborne illnesses. Next slide, please. But we also need to think about the kinds of foods that are involved in outbreaks. And these data, again, are also from the European Food Safety Authority from their most recent report, uh, indicating that water is, is still a concerning kind of uh, vehicle for illness, and obviously we, we use water in food preparation. But I think it's also important to think about other kinds of foods um, mixed meals, things with multi-ingredients, but then getting down into the specifics related to different kinds of meat products, dairy products, and eggs as well. These can help us identify where we need to make sure that food safety practices related to handling of these foods are absolutely sound. Next slide, please. But what are the risks? We have some data related to those factors that contribute to foodborne illness. Now, these are not um, necessarily causal factors because it's difficult with our current extent of foodborne illness surveillance programs, honestly, to get to a root cause absolutely all the time. But as disease investigators, et cetera, have, it, have gone in to look at illnesses and, and really dig into what's going on, They've identified several different areas of factors that likely contributed to those illnesses. Certainly things related to the source of the food um, and what happened before that food came into the restaurant or food service entity. Then things related to temperature, related to cooking, but also holding of these food products. We see issues with cross-contamination and also things related to poor personal hygiene. So back to our poll question related to hand washing, that would certainly fall into that bucket as well. So we do see that hand washing or lack thereof can contribute to illness. And I think it's data like these that can help frame this up even more helpfully. Next slide, please. We know that food safety issues can pose significant brand risks as well. Looking at many, many outbreaks, we have seen that food service companies can tend to see as much as double-digit sales decline following a food safety incident. And in some cases, it takes years to recover from that incident, and unfortunately, some do not recover at all. It's estimated by the National Restaurant Association that in U.S. dollars, um, it may cost $75,000 per establishment for each incidence of a foodborne illness that gets publicized significantly. And this includes, obviously, health costs, but also legal fees uh, and uh, wages, et cetera. So in general, we see that food safety can certainly drive down sales, keep customers away, and certainly damage the reputation of an establishment. Next slide, please. Also among consumers, we see increasing concern on their part related to food safety. The data play this out. It's estimated by the World Health Organization that one in 10 people get sick each year around the world from consuming contaminated food or beverages. And unfortunately, as many as 400,000 or more of them die because of food burn illness each year. So these contribute to figures such as the others on the slide where Half of uh, consumers generally think that food service establishments may not be doing enough to provide consumers with safe food. And more than half are concerned when they eat out. And in general, their concerns about food safety have increased. In addition, we know that consumers' demographics are changing. The reality is we are aging, and with that inevitability, our sensitivity to things like foodborne illness 
increasing. And I think most telling of all, 90% of the people who were surveyed said that they do take note of food safety incidents at restaurants when making their dining choices. So clearly it has an impact on what their thoughts are. Next slide, please. So certainly with all of these headwinds out there, it's absolutely key that food safety programs be formalized, certainly to create a better experience for your guests, but also to create a stronger protection for your business. This will result in better guest satisfaction, I believe in engagement of your staff, and certainly reduction of risk and overall brand protection. Next slide, please. So there's various components of a strong food safety program that need to be in place in order for these outcomes to be achieved. Next slide. And we'll go through these in some detail, but generally it gets down to having a clean environment, safe food, ensuring compliance, and by that, ensuring that you have visibility to what's going on, and then certainly training and awareness of food safety is very key as well. Next slide. So firstly, thinking about clean environments. And this relates to many things within a restaurant, including hand hygiene. And we talked about that in the polling question. And the, the gist of it is make sure that it's a priority, that it's convenient and top of mind. And I'll direct your attention to the gray box on this slide, which highlights results of a study that was conducted a while back that actually went in and surveyed restaurant workers to look at potential barriers to their hand washing. And as you can see, the several things listed as identified barriers to hand washing actually uh, indicate that all of the answers to our polling question could be seen as one of those. So regardless of what answer you, you chose, you are in line with what the research showed. I believe that focusing on these barriers is the way to turn these behaviors around to make hand washing less of a barrier. But in addition to hands, we need to think about surfaces in a restaurant. Using properly registered and approved sanitizers or disinfectants for food contact surfaces, and then cleaning between tasks, cleaning equipment, cutting boards, knives, et cetera, to avoid cross-contamination from one kind of food, like a raw meat, to a different kind of food. Next slide, please. But we need to think about those non-food contact surfaces as well, as they can be a source of potentially harmful agents. Things like surfaces in a restroom, also high-touch surfaces and items like door handles and rails, even menus, dining tables. Also making sure that dishwashing is done properly at the right temperatures with the right detergents and any sanitizers that might be used in those operations. And then thinking about things like floors and drains, ice machines, and other surfaces that are inevitable in a food service environment. We've done some research indicating that pathogens such as listeria, salmonella, and staphylococcus, frankly, are everywhere within food service. We found that half of kitchen floors were contaminated with these agents, a large number of mops and buckets, and an even larger percent of floors and drains were contaminated, and these were based on a survey of over 100 food service locations. Next slide, please. So in addition to clean environments, we need to think about the food itself that we are bringing into that environment. And, and as you recall, there were a um, about 10 to 15 percent of the time where unsafe source contributed to outbreaks of illness. So key here is knowing your vendors and perhaps enlisting the services of a knowledgeable food safety expert who can help you evaluate them 
for their use of things like good agricultural practices, good hygiene practices, et cetera. This also includes basic things like making sure the delivery trucks who bring food into an establishment are sanitary, have proper refrigeration, et cetera. Making sure that all food is not expired and properly dated so that you know when to discard it. And then making sure that um, the delivery itself is examined carefully, looked for sanitary conditions, and never be afraid to refuse a truck if it looks suspicious. As guidance, it's recommended that delivery trucks, if they're carrying refrigerated goods, be set to a maximum of 8 degrees C and ideally closer to 5 degrees C or lower. Next slide, please. We also need to think about the safety of that food once it gets into the establishment as well, such as in preparation, making sure, obviously, that all food contact surfaces are sufficiently sanitized prior to food preparation. If equipment is being continually used, that it's resanitized on average about every four hours or periodically as per local regulations. You may choose to wear gloves or use gloves as directed by various regulators. And then using a thermometer to ensure that food is thoroughly cooked. This extends to storage as well, making sure that cooling units are set to the proper temperature and that they're routinely verified. For example, it's recommended that that walk-in cooler be set to five degrees or less and then from the Food Safety Authority in the UK, I pulled these recommended proper cooking temperatures, which are in line with what we see generally around the world, 74 degrees C for raw poultry, 71 for raw ground meat, and slightly lower, but still sufficiently um, uh, giving a cook a good cook um, of 52 C for a number of other kinds of foods. Next slide. So we also need to think about compliance and visibility of what um, kinds of data we're looking at. And I do believe it's really important to partner with local public health officials. Sometimes we see these as um, adversaries to business, but it's important to recognize that they really do have a lot of knowledge and insight just based on their experience of evaluating many different kinds of establishments. So inviting them into your business to be familiar with the strong food safety programs you have in place is really key to making sure that relationship is good. And if there are complaints received or if you have reason to believe that an outbreak is going on, eliciting the services of these people is really helpful for a couple of reasons. One, to get their advice and assistance, but also to consider from a public health standpoint Obviously, something may be going on, and it is important to alert the consumers in the area that something is going on to prevent other folks from getting ill. It's also important that regular assessments are conducted. There are outside third-party vendors who can do this, or yourselves internally can conduct these assessments. These can help uncover opportunities for improvement, also track progress and measure improvements. And finally, leveraging the results from these is really important to learn about best practices and, again, highlight opportunities where there may be room for improvement. And on the right-hand side of this slide, I have outlined what we have seen in an evaluation of health department inspection violations for many thousands of locations here in the U.S., and based on what I've seen, I think, um, in general, these are repeated and can be seen to represent what's going on around the world, in that we see issues related to cleanliness of those facilities, um, think non-food contact surfaces here. Also, food contact surfaces not necessarily being sufficiently cleaned or designed properly so that they can be cleaned. Issues related to hand-washing sinks, look at that, signage not being, um, or, or sorry, storage not, 
applies, rather not being sufficiently applied or the sinks may be blocked. Then we see issues with temperature, hand wash sinks, even issues related to lighting that I think can impact the overall facility itself. So I think knowledge of kind of where the issues are, and, and I do think this is a good representative sample, can help us hone in on where improvements may be needed. Next slide, please. And I want to highlight an example where we used this with a customer who came to us asking for help. And as you see um, in the restaurant violation frequency column, um, this is the data from this particular customer who came to us. And we compared this to the general average for the rest of the industry. And you can see there were opportunities at this particular customer ranging from one and a half to um, 2.6 times more likely for them to see issues over what the general average was seen, particularly in areas related to hand washing, the use of toxic substances such as chemicals that would be used in improper storage, and then issues related to cold holding of the food. So using these data, we help this customer design procedures and implement products and so on that would help achieve improvement. Next slide, please. For example, on the product side, we made sure that they were using properly registered products from the Environmental Protection Agency, which is the organization here in the state, which, takes, which oversees uh, sanitizers used in food service applications. We also made sure that they had better consistent control of temperature and time, that they were using the right hand hygiene products. We recommended color coding for products and labels and dispensers of various dishwashing detergents and things like that. We also provided them chemical safety information and helped them get on regular servicing of their equipment. Next slide, please. But in addition to providing tools and products to them, the procedures are really important because proper implementation and use of these key tools is, is very important. So things like making sure procedures and guidelines were set in place, making sure these were properly posted but also available to the employees in languages that were appropriate to the workforce, and then we optimize storage of uh, items in their restaurant. Next slide. In addition, service and training was important. This included some initial education and training to just level set everyone, but also keeping track of what was being done over time, such as with cleaning and sanitization, on the use of new products for new employees, we brought in video resources and then performed regular service visits and third-party assessments to continually monitor their progress and look for improvements. Next slide, please. The good news is that although results are still coming in, we're seeing very positive outcomes with enhanced food safety, less issues with employee safety, and enhance guest satisfaction, which I think is, is most key here, just from these basic steps. By evaluating violations for what was going on and regularly um, looking for improvements, ongoing support and training, which was provided, implementing preventive maintenance and fast fixes where needed, also point of use materials, again, the signage and so on, um, other types of mechanisms to keep food safety top of mind, and then making sure that management was involved um, both at the establishment level but also at a corporate level as well to make sure they were aware of the particular results um, and could be informed about where improvements could be needed but where real great um, improvements were being seen as well. Next slide. 
So the fourth component of a food safety program, as was illustrated in that previous example, is training and awareness. So leading by example, I think, is most key. I think the management of an establishment is a very, very key part of that organization. And they should be definitely modeling the behaviors they want to see as far as um, con practicing proper hand hygiene, making sure that they are aware of cleanliness of surfaces, of temperature control, even the source and, and condition of food as they're coming into the establishment. Really, really modeling those behaviors that relate to those contributing factors. But this also needs to funnel down, obviously, to employees so that they're trained on the full program. And think about things like clean environments, the safety of the food, as well as compliance to various regulations and making sure those results are visible so they can be used as learning opportunities. Building engagement is really key making sure that the work is meaningful and that food safety is part of that food service establishment uh, vision and purpose. Setting goals and challenges and, and perhaps using signage or other tools to indicate progress on achieving lowered numbers of violations, um, the improvements in behavior, and so on. Making sure training programs are evolved to the particular needs of the employee making sure they're brief, yet very impactful, perhaps visual, and very, very interactive. Finally, being transparent. Looking for ideas from the staff themselves who are working every day in these environments, building off their energy, and being open about challenges uh, that exist and eliciting uh, requests for help, but also highlighting successes that are achieved. At this point, Russ, um, I will turn it back to you and, and do we have questions that have come in? We, we do. So uh, thanks, uh, Ruth, for that. Uh, it's a really comprehensive overview of uh, what is a very complicated topic. But I must say, I do love the simplicity and clarity uh, of the uh, the program, clean environments, safe food, visibility and compliance. Once you get that set in your head, that I think really makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, so thank you to you all for your questions as well. We've had quite a few. Um, number one frequently asked question is, can we get uh, the presentation uh, afterwards? Uh, and for sure you'll be sent a link uh, to the presentation, the recording, and uh, other resources as well. Um, but the uh, questions for uh, you, Ruth, for your expertise, uh, the first question uh, that came in, um, what do you consider to be the biggest food safety risk today in kitchens in the food industry? This is always interesting, and I, and I think we need to look at, at kind of the way the world is today and the fact that we all have access to much more global kinds of information. Um, the reality is that our food choices today are much more vast than they were in, in the past. Part of this, I think, is because we are a more mobile society, so we um, often are fortunate to travel to different kinds of places or through various media to hear about interesting food items that might be available around the world. Just look at the uh, preponderance of cooking shows, for example. Some of these products are very complex, very interesting, um, and it requires us potentially to be sourcing items and flavors and spices and ingredients, et cetera, from longer distances. I realize there is a focus in some markets on local sourcing, but often to supplement those locally sourced say, meats and, and produce items, um, we need to bring in, again, some of these interesting ingredients from far away. I think that adds complexity for sure, um, adds a lot of fun to dining out. But we need to be aware of what risks those may provide. They may be novel ingredients, novel food sources that we haven't worked with in the past and, and may have very little knowledge of. They, we may not know a lot about how they were handled before they crossed the globe to get to the back door of a food service establishment. So being aware and being knowledgeable about the uh, 
production practices, which could include farming um, or rearing of an animal, um, uh, as well as handling, transportation, et cetera, that might go on. And although that certainly uh, needs to be in place for those far-reachingly sourced ingredients, it also needs to be in place for those that we might source from the farmer next door uh, and making sure that those foods are handled and um, handled properly and, and not subject to any sort of contamination. I think another food safety risk today is, is the inevitability of human behaviors. And as we saw in the polling questions and also in the research that I presented, um, we are busier people today. In many cases, restaurants are busier. Um, we are seeing relatively high turnover among food safety, or excuse me, food service employees. Um, so constantly keeping on top of all of these kinds of things um, is challenging. And um, certainly in a perfect world, everybody needs to do everything properly all the time. We know that's not going to happen. So keying in on those behaviors that are most key to food safety, I think, can help avert some of these risks, uh, which gets back to the inevitability of, of humans trying to do the right thing but occasionally making mistakes. Yeah, and I think uh, that's a, a great answer to a really good question. The first step is awareness, so congratulations, everybody, on taking this first step in uh, g uh, gathering uh, additional awareness. Actually, a related uh, question to that, because you mentioned about the uh, high employee turnover in food service locations that can be a factor there. Uh, uh, this question came in. What advice could you give to assure that food safety training is undertaken even when that turnover is very high? I think this is the key to make that training as interactive as possible and as available as possible. I recall being in an establishment recently um, where they had mounted um, uh, electronic screens in many places throughout the restaurant. They used these for everything from the time clock where people indicated that they you know, came into work or, or were leaving work, but it also prompted them to um, take quick one, two-minute, three-minute um, fun kinds of training that when they were uh, had a little bit of a break or perhaps as they signed in uh, on coming into the restaurant, they were prompted to go uh, get a little interactive video or a message related to one of these behaviors. Um, the days of, frankly, sitting in front of a PowerPoint uh, presentation really need to um, be reconsidered. There certainly are opportunities for doing that, but the reality of a fast-paced restaurant environment today with turnover, we need to get more creative with some of these kinds of messaging. There's also been some research demonstrating that the more um, kind of graphic we can get in these messages, the more they are remembered. And there's an interesting series of um, training research that has been done when um, actual pictures are shown to uh, restaurant employees related to the outcomes. And, and in some cases, it's, it's rather graphic. That is showing someone getting sick or someone um, obviously ill and perhaps home in their bed um, because they are not able to work. And those kinds of, of images they found in the research were remembered by these employees and impacted them with improvements in things like hand hygiene, um, not working when they were ill, and so on. So I think it's, it's making sure these trainings are available, that they're fun, and that they really will grab someone's attention so that they're remembered. Okay, great. Good, uh, good advice, uh, Ruth. Um, I've, I've certainly come across this uh, kind of attitude uh, before. Um, this question says, in our restaurant, we've never knowingly had an instance of foodborne illness. So how do we avoid the mentality in our food service team where they feel, oh, we don't need to worry because we've been doing this stuff for years? Yeah, I, I certainly can appreciate that um, that feeling. And, and if we think about it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of how some of us live our lives as well. You know, I've, I've 
never had a major car accident, for example. Um, you know, I, I take precautions, but again, it's really never happened to me. Um, yet, I think here we need to look to the, to the broader data set, and such as some of the facts that we presented earlier here. You know, the, the inevitable cost of a foodborne illness outbreak from a financial standpoint, um, also the human costs as far as um, numbers of people dying from foodborne illness, tapping into resources. Um, again, this is where that local health authority, health department officials, et cetera, um, or perhaps at the, at the national level within your country can be helpful on framing up what does this really mean in your particular market. Um, there are public, uh, there is published information about different kinds of outbreaks. Um, and I think as best as possible, trying to personalize an outbreak, which certainly um, I understand didn't occur in that particular establishment, but making um, those out there kind of outbreaks um, seem more real by personalizing it to the particular location perhaps honing in on those outbreaks that have been related to similar kinds of food that are served in the restaurant, um, in similar kinds of restaurants. Is it a, um, hot, you know, a, a, a hamburger restaurant or a salad restaurant, et cetera? Um, it, you know, really looking for those and digging in and with um, certainly a much more um, – friendly internet today, it is possible to, to find this information and to bring it home. It does take some effort, um, and I think that's where management has a really key role in helping with this. In addition, um, again, I encourage you to use some of the materials we've presented here, and um, in a little bit we will be acquainting you with some resources that you may choose to use um, that can supplement this as well. Great, great answer. And, and of course, you only need one outbreak to damage your reputation um, pretty permanently. <clears throat> As we know, 10 people will tell 10 people who will tell 10 people. So that spreads uh, re really fast. Uh, talking of fast, uh, something, uh, a question from, uh, I think, our QSR customers here. Uh, Ruth, it says, with labor concerns in restaurants increasing, more franchisees are wanting to purchase dishwashers. In your experience, do you feel that dishwashers in uh, quick service restaurants are reducing? or increasing the food safety risks? Well, certainly I think of items that would be washed in a dishwasher are food contact surfaces, just as a countertop or, or you know, a cooking service surface, rather, would be. So making sure that, that those surfaces of, of the various uh, wares that would be used in a restaurant are clean is really, really important. Um, I do think the use of dishwashers can result in more consistent application of the standard washing and then sanitizing or disinfecting practices to make sure that those, again, very important food contact surfaces are cleaned and made sanitary as they are supposed to be. Now, key with that, though, is following the right procedures, as with anything. It's one thing to give someone a tool but we have to make sure they know how to use it. So making sure those um, dishwashers are, are set up appropriately with the proper temperature water, with the right products dispensed at the right concentrations um, for the right duration of time is really key. And these are machines. And just like any machine that we have in our lives, like our cars or our furnaces at home, they take maintenance. We can't just put them in and forget about them. Um, at some point, they need to be looked at and inspected to make sure that they are working properly and then repairs uh, needed if, if they are needed. Um, but in general, I have seen that the use of dishwashers can result in more consistent uh, application of um, cleaning food contact surfaces, which um, we all know is really important. And as the inspection results showed, was among the top 10 of violations that were seen. Oh, 
Uh, great information, thank you. So I think the information about the seven uh, uh, potential barriers to hand washing has really spiked uh, interest because we've got kind of three questions I'm going to bundle together as the same. So the question just came in to say, how can we ensure that personnel uh, are looking better at their hand washing? Um, and then um, thinking about uh, use of gloves as well. So uh, what's the best way to monitor if staff are changing their gloves as often as they should uh, and how to make sure the management are taking responsibility to enforce the correct use of gloves and hi hand hygiene practices. So it's all around kind of gloves and the hand hygiene piece there, Ruth. Sure. Well, first of all, thinking about gloves, um, they can be a very effective tool for preventing cross-contamination. And um, I've seen them used very successfully. The key is that they're used properly. Um, think of, we need to educate and make sure people are aware that gloves are used for protecting other people from what you as an employee or food handler may potentially transmit. They certainly have some role in protecting the food handler, him or herself, but their real role is to protect that person who is being served by that food handler. And I think that's an important distinction that I'm not sure um, is considered enough. So I think highlighting what the um, responsibility is related to gloves. They're not just a, again, way to keep your hands from getting dirty. They're, again, this tool to prevent you from um, contaminating other people. Um, that said, ways to monitor proper glove usage um, does require um, some basic observation, and this is where the role of the manager and supervisors, et cetera, is really key, um, to make sure that they're being changed when they need to be, um, that they're not uh, essentially worn all day and, and never taken off. They do need to be changed. Um, I've seen a couple interesting practices used where in one particular restaurant company, they use different colors of gloves and one particular color for handling raw chicken. And then um, it was known that people wearing that particular color were the raw chicken handler people, and they had a different color glove for handling ready-to-eat or post-cook kinds of food. So it was very easy to see if by chance there was an error and someone went with one of those uh, bra handling gloves um, was in the wrong area of the restaurant because they had the wrong color there um, and to use them as educational tools. And I think that was a real um, creative yet, yet pretty simple way for them to quickly scan across the restaurant and know um, whether the proper gloves were being used. Then there's some just some basics. I think especially that restaurant manager has a good sense of the typical traffic patterns in their local establishment, uh, when the busy times are, how many uh, meals they're stirring on a daily basis, et cetera. That's just standard stuff that you would know. So I think it's a matter then of, of using that information to try to get to an idea of, well, how many gloves might that mean that we would use in a typical shift? Um, and then, one way to do it is just to monitor glove usage. You know, you have a box of, of maybe 100 gloves. Um, is that glove, uh, are those gloves going down in the box? Um, you know, such that at the end of the day, the box is empty or half empty or whatever it is supposed to be based on the particular situation. Um, so, it, you know, my point with gloves is it sounds really easy, and I think with the right forethought, it can be, but there needs to be some attention paid to um, proper consideration of how they're used uh, as well as monitoring of those. Um, related to that, um, hand hygiene is very important as well, and certainly hands need to be washed properly before those gloves are put on. Um, but basic things, um, again, going back to that research and also the polling questions, that we had early on, um, I always think about ways to improve hand hygiene are to look at those barriers. So the research showed that restaurants generally that were busier um, had more, more uh, meals being served. There were more hand wash violations. Also, there were more violations seen among 
um, those uh, busier people. So perhaps uh, people had many, many tasks to do, and they frankly just couldn't take the time that they needed um, to get to and to wash their hands. And then making sure that hand hygiene experience, and this sounds kind of ethereal, but, but that it's as comfortable as possible. You know, is that sink clean? Um, is it in an area that's, that's easy to get to, that you don't have to climb over a bunch of boxes to get to it? Um, there even was some research showing that someone was able to somehow tie in a, a music playing system into their hand wash sink, such that when people turned on water, the music came on. And it, you know, was fun, kind of lively music, and it was engaging to the employees, so they actually stood there at the sink washing their hands a little bit longer because they got to hear some music. Again, real basic kinds of, of practices like that, but thinking creatively um, can really help them. Yeah, I love those ideas of getting creative, uh, engaging in different ways, and making a little bit of a surprise. Uh, and the colored gloves is a really, really good uh, idea as well. Um, in uh, the clean environments uh, section, uh, you talked about the cleaning equipment between tasks. Uh, there's questions about um, you were heading towards a 24-hour society where premises can be open at times where they might traditionally being closed. So how can operators ensure their equipment is clean really 24-7 and they're maintaining food safety practices at all times? Sure. Um, I really appreciate that question. And, and, yes, we are seeing more and more operations being open much, much longer hours. I think, again, it's, it's being aware of what the traffic patterns are like within the restaurant. Um, perhaps during those overnight hours, um, I would assume that the, that the numbers of people coming into that restaurant probably are lower. Um, and using that time to leverage to the advantage of the restaurant, perhaps offering a more limited menu, um, to allow time for attention to, be, uh, to still be given to cleaning, and perhaps um, even preparing food ahead as might be possible. Um, you know, to allow it to be available, but still allow for effective time for proper cleaning um, and keeping those food contact surfaces as sanitary as possible. So I think it's a matter of knowing the market very well and taking advantage of those potentially slower times, even in a 24-7 kind of restaurant, um, to make sure that everything is um, spick and span um, and ready for when the busy time starts, perhaps the next morning. Yeah, yeah, and the, the kind of 24-hour society and, you know, things moving faster and faster has prompted this, my favorite question of the day, uh, as most of us uh, do spend a lot of time glued to our mobile devices in these digital days. Uh, have you heard of any cases where the use of a mobile phone in a food service environment has resulted in cross-contamination? Oh, that's a really interesting one. Um, certainly, I think the potential is there. Um, I can't point, though, to a documented outbreak where we, you know, can tie something back directly to that device. You know, that said, um, there have been studies where various kinds of devices have been tested for the presence of bacteria, and they are there. Um, if you just think about handling of your phone, putting it up to your ear, for example. Humans are a tremendous source of bacteria. So I think the potential is there. Um, it's frankly not likely that we're all walking around with lots and lots of disease-causing bacteria all over us, or frankly, we would be a lot sicker. Um, but I think um, it's important to have a policy related to mobile devices. And if nothing else, certainly it, it distracts from servicing your guests to the level that you would probably want them um, to be. But I think realizing that the, sort, that the potential is there, and even I've been in establishments where you are handed in, you know, electronic tablet um, and actually order your food using that and then hand that back in or, or something like that, um, making sure there, are, again, that, that there's an awareness there and at least that those items are, are wiped down in a way that obviously is not going to damage the electronics, um, but that attention is paid.
Yeah, it's a great, great answer. And uh, I'm reminded of the uh, uh, hotel guest rooms where telephones and remote controls for the TVs are famous harbingers of uh, many, many uh, different uh, different things. Um, just time, I think, for one uh, last uh, question um, here. So, um, and, and I think you kind of covered this, but maybe it's a chance just to uh, re recapture. Which measures should restaurants take to prevent a foodborne illness? Um, you know, I think if we jump to my last slide, actually, that will answer that very well. Can we have the next okay. slide come up? Um, so I think preventing foodborne illness is all about being aware of what those hazards could be. Um, things like being aware of the potential um, contaminants that might be in the food. For example, if you're receiving in raw meat uh, or fish or, or produce, being aware of what the hazards are and thinking about the data we presented on foods that are more likely to be associated with illness. But then making sure to assess the risk. Maybe you're getting in raw chicken, but then you are cooking it. So obviously that decreases the risk of, say, a salmonella contaminant. So being aware of the sources of the contamination, how they can be spread, um, including routes like from surfaces, um, from humans, um, et cetera, and then staying up on the science, being aware of new developments. Um, with the information age today and more sensitive detection technologies, we are learning more and more about, frankly, new sources of these kinds of illness agents than we ever knew before, and we're seeing different kinds of foods being implicated. Um, so it's, it's kind of... Um, to a geek like me, kind of interesting to study, but it prevents some real um, risks that need to be considered, and I think being knowledgeable is really key. Making sure then against all of these risks that you have preventive controls in place that will address these risks. So proper cooking of foods to the right temperatures, proper handling of foods uh, from a temperature storage perspective, Proper practices with food handlers themselves. Again, the use of gloves, as we talked about, proper hand washing to remove contaminants, et cetera. And then making sure these procedures and practices are enforced with staff and then reinforced. And we talked through various ways of making sure awareness is there and training and so on. Verification is really key, and this can take a lot of various forms, but tracking data, perhaps, uh, monitoring temperatures of food items, of coolers, of, of the grill surfaces to make sure they're working right, um, and looking at the data to make sure that, that they're consistently met over time and that there aren't issues with um, perhaps cooling systems getting a little bit um, out of whack and, and in need of maintenance. I think it really is important to build connections and invest in food safety, thinking about what tools and new technologies might be available, thinking about various partnerships and approaches. Um, but at the end of the day, and I certainly will um, end with this, but being persistent is really key. This is a changing world on a lot of fronts these days, and we need to be persistently um, up on what we're thinking about. And I think these um, items here outlined on the slide can help remind us of what we need to do. Next slide, please. So really, um, as we've gone through this, I think it's important um, to think about um, the importance of food safety. And food safety certainly does matter to all of you and to Ecolab. So some various tips that we've come up with for a strong food safety program I include focus on clean environments, making sure your hand wash stations are uh, visible, accessible, and stocked. Regular cleaning protocols are in place for both food contact and non-food contact surfaces, that you have a relationship with health authorities, that you assess what's going on and stay connected. Next that you think about the food itself, working with uh, reputable suppliers and have procedures for handling that equipment, uh, 
And then certainly training and awareness, establishing rigorous onboarding for new hires and then follow-up for continuing staff and then having appropriate signage to keep these practices top of mind. Perfect answer. Great, uh, Ruth. A great, great preemptive uh, question that came in there. We lucked out uh, with uh, that. So uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Petran for your expertise today. Thank you for all your questions. Uh, we did not get a chance to answer all of them, but we will circle back to you via your local eCollab representative. Uh, and one of the questions was about the service that your territory manager can provide. Uh, and that's a great reminder that your territory manager is a really great place to start, whether you need service, information, advice, or staff training. Uh, and they can help you identify risks. And they do have a whole team behind them as well if, uh, uh, you know, you really need to get some uh, detail and depth into your food uh, safety requirements. Uh, so uh, um, there are also a whole host of resources available uh, for you today as a participant in this webinar, including a food safety checklist, uh, as well as links to others in the series of the public health uh, webinars. Uh, and on the screen, you see the links and you'll find that in the presentation that will be mailed to you in the next uh, few days. So uh, thanks again to uh, Dr. Ruth Petran. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar. And as I mentioned up front, we'd love to get your thoughts about what you've heard today and ideas about what topics would be essential for you in the future too. Uh, when you leave the session, there'll be a pop-up window with a short survey, and it would be great to get your feedback. My name is Russ Lewell, and I'd like to wish you every success in delivering food safety in your facility. Until next time, goodbye.